Just allow his gaze to rest upon you. Allow the delight of the Father to rest upon you. And as your breathing begins to slow, as the anxieties begin to fade, and as we fix our attention to God, who is worthy of all our attention, would we receive the grace right now to receive his help to fix our attention to him, to receive his help to give our souls exactly what it desires right now, to love and to be loved by God. So church, let us invite the Holy Spirit as we sing these songs, as we receive the word, as we do communion, would it be in a posture of receiving God's grace? So Holy Spirit, we come. For whatever reason, we're in these walls, Lord, we're here. God, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this building, for this church, that we could come with one heart and one faith, and our gaze could be united to you, God. We worship you, Lord, with one voice and with one spirit, Lord. You and you alone are worthy of our attention and our love, Lord. So would you be glorified in all that we do, Lord. In your precious son's name we pray, amen. Let's worship, church. I've never known love like yours. So intimate, so powerful. I've tasted and I've seen, but nothing comes close. I've never known a love like yours. Jesus, your name is power. It's breath and living water. Your
to the heart of the oh your spirit guides me to the heart of the sing that your spirit guides me to the heart of the father
How I feel, I can't begin to tell you what our love has meant. I'm lost for words. Is there a way to show the passion in my heart? Can I express how truly great I think you are?
this space right now for us. You know, the song talks about a very, um, it's, it's a really grand moment in the Bible when the woman pours out the jar of oil upon Jesus' feet. Something so magnificent, full of adoration and love and praise. And as I was meditating upon this word this week, a part of me felt that um, there's no way this could have happened if her life was already at a stage of spending time with Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. And you know, in this, uh, in this month, the church, um, from the stage, what's been being preached is to pray with faith and to have your feet planted firmly on him so that we will not be shaken. And there's a conviction that grows as we spend time with Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. There's a conviction that goes against rationale, that is countercultural, that does, just does not make sense. The woman, as she went to buy the jar of oil, she could have stopped there and been thinking, what am I doing here? What is, this is not, this is too much. But the Bible doesn't show any of that. It just shows this beautiful moment of adoration and love. So our prayer for this church is that as we're moving this direction, really of Ecclesia spending time in community, you know, what we've, this past Friday, what I heard from a lot of my, uh, my friends is that, um, gosh, we feel stuck. But I really pray that in this season, that even as we are stuck, Jesus sees that, he hears us, and to him, there's something else happening in the heavens. What happens in the heavens, you know, we cannot see here. So I pray we lean into that, knowing that God is still working in the midst of it all. And that as we spend time praying and really pressing in, even if we don't see any change or any movement right here on earth, I pray that that would add to our times with our ecclesias, our times in church, our times in community that we would not come to church to hear a word, to be refreshed, but instead we would do that through the week and bring that so that in our spaces, we can do things that are not really like us. I'm an introvert, but the may I be social out there and love on one another. I pray for that, that what we do with Jesus one-on-one -on -one can be added to our space here at church. And that's how revival is gonna happen. We believe in that. We believe in the refreshment. We believe in God still moving, still moving, because he is good and he loves us. There are no shortcuts because God loves us and he values spending time with us. So I just wanna open up this space even more. If there's just something to just, Lord, I give this to you, I give you, um, my, un, my discomfort level, I give you, God, the places that I'm stuck. Let's just give that to Jesus one more time because he hears us because he loves us so much. Just wanna move your 
You know, as the as the worship keeps keeps playing, I just sense that there's grace for us to pray for one another. And so right now, before we do anything, I want you to just allow yourself to locate where you are with God. I just felt like there's some of us that feel like we're really far from God. And so right now, if that's you, just just allow yourself to be seen by God. To notice that it's not bad or good. Just to notice where you are. And right now, I just sense that um, we as a community need to pray for these brothers and sisters. Because we too have been at that place, right? We too have been in those places where we feel far from God. And so right now, church, let's just do it in an act of faith. You don't have to put hands on anyone. I'm not going to ask you guys to, like, you know, reveal yourselves or anything. But right now, if you are in a position where you just want to pray for your brothers and sisters in this room, in this community, let's just take a moment to pray in the spirit for our brothers and sisters who might feel stuck, as Connie mentioned, or those of us who might feel far. And let's just feel the spirit minister to these people, these brothers and sisters who might be here in these, this room. Maybe it's you. If you yourself feel stuck or, or far, would you just allow yourself to receive in the spirit the prayers of the saints, the prayers of our brothers and sisters who are interceding on your behalf right now. So right now, church, would you just pray? Pray in the spirit, pray in faith for those brothers and sisters. Allow the Holy Spirit to give in you a holy compassion, a holy compassion for these brothers and sisters who might feel far. Lord, you are not far from us, Lord. The scripture says that you draw near when we draw near to you, God. So Lord, I pray, God, for our brothers and sisters who might feel far from you, who have this, have this fear, God, that you are far who have this fear that you are not close to them, Lord. But right now, God, I pray in the spirit, Lord, you move, God. You move, God, that you administer, God, to our brothers and sisters, Lord, to sense your closeness closer than our very breath, God, closer than our very skin. Lord, that you are here and that you long to draw near to us when we draw near to you, God. So church, let's pray on their behalf. Let's pray, let's intercede for them.
that sees you as you are. Receive the spirit that loves you. And church, in this posture of worship, we're gonna transition into a time of giving of our tithes and our offerings. And as we do that, as we come up, would we continue to come, not like, God, this is out of obligation, but God, I desire for you to invade my entire life. Lord, I want you to use me as an instrument of your peace and your love, whether it's in my home, in my friendships, in my workplace, in this church, God. I'm giving you permission to use me for your good. Amen. So, Lord, um, yeah, Lord, we just want to give you permission. Lord, use us, Lord. Use us to be reflections of you, God, to even our brothers and sisters in this very place, in this very body, that they would see reflections of you in our lives, God. So, church, when you're ready, let's give out of the abundance that God has given to us. Use it. 
Make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at your hands, at what, at what your hands have done. How great are your works, Lord. How profound your thoughts. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have made. We are grateful for the opportunity to worship you in this place, and we declare your victory in our lives. We pray that the worship that comes out of this place tonight be pleasing to your ears and that your glory resonates throughout this earth. Father, as we bring our offerings to you, we are reminded of your goodness. Thank you for always providing. We bless this offering so that it may be cheerfully built so that it may cheerfully build your kingdom. We pray for the rest of our worship service tonight. Please bless and be with Pastor Joanne as she delivers your words. Guard her heart, and may you do great things through her tonight. Prepare our hearts to hear and digest your words, and may we take what we hear tonight to the world to shine your light. We pray that you are glorified and highlighted in our day-to-day, because you are worthy of that and much more. We love you, God, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well... Welcome to Echo Church. Hi, my name is Heidi. If you don't know me, if you're new, uh, what a joy it is to be in the house of God today. So I have two announcements for anyone who's new and then two announcements for members of the house, okay? So the first announcement is today is prep dinner. Woohoo! So prep dinner, what is prep dinner? So prep ministry is a ministry comprised of members and non-members of this house whose passion it is to just cook and love on the people and create space for people to fellowship. And so right after service today, we're gonna be sharing a meal together uh, made deliciously by the hands of people who are currently slaving away in the kitchen right now. And so if you're new, um, please stop by the welcoming table right outside. It's the table that was outside. It says, welcome, exclamation point, and come and say, hi, I'm new. Can I, can I join? Can I eat with you guys? And we would be so happy to escort you over to the gym where we're going to be eating. And so also for everyone who's joining us today, if you have a ticket, please come to the gym. We're going to be eating at six o'clock. Um, you can go find a seat sit down and then we're gonna we'll we'll give you more directions as it comes but again if you're new today please feel free to come and eat with us the second thing for newcomers is we have something called orthopraxis orthopraxis is the introduction to discipleship training here at echo so what does that mean that's kind of a mouthful it's if you're curious about taking that next step toward discipleship if you're like hey, I want to be part of this church. I don't really know how. Orthopraxis is the first step to becoming a member, but it's also for a great way for you to learn more about your faith. If you're exploring your faith or you just want to take that next step, it's a really great way to learn more and to journey with people in the body. So if you're interested in orthopraxis, we also have something out on the welcoming table. You can click the QR code and we can tell you more about it there as well. All right, so the second two, second part for members is one, um, you know, as you may or may not know, Pastor Brian was going to preach today, but we were so eager. We were so eager. We forgot to give some important information. So this week, Pastor Joanne is actually preaching today. He's, Pastor Brian's going to return to the pulpit. We can't wait to hear from him. But this week for members, we will have a board town hall meeting this Wednesday night at 9 p.m., on Zoom. You should have received an email. If you didn't, please come find one of us. Pastors or staff will be happy to give you the Zoom link. We just want to update you guys on what's been happening the last several months, restructuring, restoration, all of the good things. And so um, please try to come out. It will be recorded. So if you can't make it for some reason, 
um, come find one of our board members or ask one of us if you have questions. And the second part of that is we also want to share with you guys what this season has looked like. So right after the meeting, we're going to be publishing a conversation between myself, Pastor Joanne, and Pastor Brian on the Echo app for you guys to listen at your own time. We just wanted to give you guys an opportunity to hear from Pastor Brian and Pastor Joanne how this last season was for our church, what we're feeling, God moving us into the future. So that'll be available right after the town hall meeting um, on Wednesday. So we can't wait to share that with you guys, um, but we just felt it was really necessary, important to, to let you guys know before we receive Pastor Brian again. Amen? All right. So before Pastor Joanne comes and gives the word, if you could just turn to someone next to you, say hello. And the mingle question today is, how long have you waited for something that was worth it? And what was it? Does that question make sense? Just, yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> Maybe we need to do this once in a while. This question is a hot one. Everyone looks happy. I like it. I like it. Hey, Echo. I want to hear about it. Well, I'm going to tell you mine first because I think mine is good. Mine is good. I waited 27 years for my husband, TJ. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And I had to wait a little bit longer to marry him, but... Or maybe he had to wait. I don't know. It was, it's good. Anybody else? Something you waited for a long time. And it was good. No can't top it? I know. Really, the, a blessed woman of God right here. So, um, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have started off with me because mine is so awesome and I don't want to shame you, but I did. I'm so sorry, you guys. Pastor Joanne here, not, not starting off on the right foot, but hey, it's the last week of January. You had like 28 days to settle into 2024. How's it going? Yeah? Do you feel like you know your way around this year now? You have a sense of, you know, where you're headed, what you need to do to get there? Yeah, I hope so, I hope so. But we still have more time and we're gonna do it together, okay? I know um, we initially announced, as Heidi said, that Pastor Brian would be here. So some of you guys are sad, like, I saw that woman just a couple weeks ago. I know, next week you will see him. And thank you so much for your patience. Not just about this, but in all the ways that we've been patient and waiting together in the delays. And so that's what I wanna talk about Today, um, the title is Delay. The clever gene in me has died. Like it won't come back. Sometimes I wait a long time and I go maybe towards the end of the weekend. Like, you know, it'll come to me. But the muse is nowhere to be found. And I'm like, I say delay a lot, so it will be called delay. So we're going to talk about that today, okay? So as we get into the Lord, let's pray because we need the Lord to breathe on this, okay? So let's pray as we get into the word today. Ooh. Lord Jesus, we come to you and we look to you and open to Holy Spirit who speaks to us the heart of God for our very situation, for our very next steps. 
You hold our lives in your hands and your hands are strong and loving and trustworthy to form us and carry us through. We open ourselves to your living word and your right now word for us. Help us to obey and follow you with faith to see you rightly and love you with our devotion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I wanna go right into the passage. Today's passage comes from Mark chapter five, verses 21 to 43. And I don't know if you're good at subtraction, but that's quite a few verses, more than we usually um, share on pulpit. And so stay with me as you hear the word of God. Hear now the word of the Lord. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She has suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talita kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I know that we had Ecclesia, first Ecclesia of the year this past week, right? Woo! Yes? Woo! Yeah? You guys are like, we're tired because we went to Ecclesia. Some of you guys had it on Tuesday, I know. That group looks like popping. Like they look so like they got good sleep the night before. They look so like glowing and there's so many of them. It looks like a party. And I know there's a Saturday group out here, yeah? The ones with the the blessed babies, right? Like lots of babies. And so you guys are meeting on Saturday. I meet on Fridays. And I know whichever day you went, whichever day you signed up for, you know, you came after work, a lot of you guys, you know, bringing food, bringing your kids, bringing your desire for connection in the community, and, you know, bringing your pains and your burdens into that time. You know, as I was listening to our people in Ecclesia and throughout this week, I was able to put my ears to the soil of our hearts, And I just was like, man, you guys are all caring so much. Some of you have been weathered by delays and disappointments of this season, and it really shows. In your thought life, you speak negative things to yourself and about other people, things that are contrary to God's heart and perspective. In your heart, there's this resentment that you try, but you can't quite shake it off. And 
You've, you're feeling these big feelings disproportionate to the event of the day or the conversation that's being had right now. And our precious relationships that God's given to us, they're taking a lot of hits or they have gone to sleep and are now on autopilot. And our prayers, our prayers are dry or some of us, it's dead silent. Does this resonate with any of you? I think the ones that it resonates with are the ones that are not looking at me. (laughs) Are delays and disappointments in life subjecting you to something far less than the abundant life that flows out of Christ? Then this word is for you today. Today's passage has key characters that I want us to pay close attention to. Okay, so we're going to rope back into the story. The first one is Jairus. I know I haven't heard anyone name their kid Jairus. Seems like a good guy, you know? Jairus was a synagogue leader, and it's safe to say that his crew and Jesus didn't mix well throughout Jesus' ministry here on earth, yeah? They were perpetually challenged in their status quo and exposed of their impure mixed motives behind their religious leadership in life. If you look at verse 22... Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hand on her so that she'll be healed and live. I know that a lot of the verses that I'm going back into in the uh, scripture reading may not be on screen, so just I'll read it slowly so you guys can kind of track with me, okay? So what Jairus did here is significant, It's a breakaway from the culture of a circle. It's a display of humility to come to Jesus and fall at his feet and look to Jesus as his ultimate, ultimate source of healing. I think sometimes desperate situations can do that. You know, when life is good, and that's good, but when life is good and life is working and life is, you know, manageable and we still have some margins left to bear the weight of the moving pieces, if we can help it, we don't like change, right? We don't like to step out of what is familiar and safe. That's for all of us. But when you're met with your own helplessness and when you can see that the way you've been does not provide a way out of your dilemma, What's the invitation? What's the good news? You are invited to the feet of Jesus who saves. But guess what? When you come to Jesus with that initial desperation and humble yourself before him, does everything change in a moment? Sometimes, sometimes, you know, we heard about it from faraway places, you know? I remember one of the first times that I went to a healing conference with my boys, and I met a woman who had gotten healing from the previous year's healing conference. She had metal rods and plates on her body, like in 50 places. She had this horrific accident, and so they had to do a lot of surgeries on her, and even after she's placed these rods and plates in her body throughout, she lived with so much pain, and she had like no range of motion. She was severely depressed, and she said she truly just wanted to die and end the pain. But then, during worship time, God had healed her in an instant that previous year. Her metal rods, like, they disappeared. The plates, they disappeared, and her range of motion returned. The kind of things, you know, she couldn't do before because she's like RoboCop, you know what I mean? And she didn't have that debilitating pain anymore. Did I just move really funny? I'm so sorry. She, so she was invited back, you know, for free because, you know, The conference organizers wanted her to share, not to use her as marketing. I mean, like, because when you share testimony, it raises your faith, right? And you go, wow, look what God did. God do it for me, you know? So guess what? She was standing right in front of me in the line as I was going into this conference on the first day. So so I'm, I'm cautiously thinking, could it be a sign? And here we are. So I have definitely seen God at work. I have seen God at work in some people's lives. So why the delay in mine? So in today's passage, Jairus' journey back home to his daughter with Jesus wasn't exactly quick and smooth sailing either. You know, he asked Jesus to come 
to heal his daughter and Jesus comes with him, but then on his way back, he experiences interruption and delay. You know, it's like you have something dire going on, it's urgent. And then something else comes to you out of left field. It's hard enough already. But up shows another thing or more complication. I mean, how do you navigate that? You know, there's a lot of examples that's around us, even in this community, right? Your spouse loses their job. But then you also hear reports that your child is struggling at school. Your marriage is strained. And your relationship with your parents exacerbates that further. You're battling depression, but then you hear news of the death of a loved one. You finally find somebody to love and to hold, but then you are battling with the timing of when God will give you a baby. Just as I find myself raising my autistic firstborn son, right? Two years in, my secondborn gets a diagnosis too. So, you know, hard things happen. And the more keeps coming. So, you know, we don't know for sure what Jairus was feeling, right? It doesn't say on this windy and snail-paced journey back home to his dying by the minute daughter. We don't know how Jairus is experiencing that, but I think there's an invitation for each of us to kind of project our own dilemmas into his shoes and, and, and wrestle there. As he is experiencing delays, what's going on inside of him? Is it anxiety? Oh no, how long is it going to take? And how will this delay impact what I desire and long for? My plans and my future. Or is it a kind of entitlement and anger? You know, I got dibs on Jesus first. He was coming with me first, so why is Jesus going out of order? That's not fair. I've been faithful all these years, doing things responsibly and right, so why am I still at the back of the line? Or there could be sadness. That's where I go fast. I knew it was too good to be true. Nothing ever works out for me as I really hope. And then there's despair, you know, whatever. He doesn't really care about how important this is to me. So I give up. How do you imagine Jairus' inner conversation and posture in the midst of this delay? Whatever is your imagination, one thing is for certain because Scripture shows us that Jairus didn't up and leave. Instead, we see him somehow, he continued the journey with Jesus until he returned home to his daughter with Jesus. No matter how he was experiencing, how long all this was taking, he kept in step with Jesus the whole way through. Jesus didn't move according to Jairus' desired timeline, but Jairus stayed with Jesus still. You see that in scripture? Yeah? So that's the first exploration of the character in the story, Jairus. Now let's look at the second character in today's passage. It's the woman. It's the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. And I Googled this because I did not want to do any math. 12 years is 4,380 days. I don't know if they counted those extra days, you know, every four years. I didn't double check, but 4,300, you know, almost 4,400 days. It's the same number of years that Jairus' daughter has been alive. Do you guys know any 12-year-olds? I mean, I know a 12-year-old because I live with one. He's taller than me. Before I was like this, like, oh, maybe he's like, yeah, he's a little. Now he's like, he's way taller than me. He eats more than me, obviously. And you know, you hear that phrase, the days are long, but the years are short. Why is that wielded against us? I know people say that to comfort you in the early years of parenting, right? They're trying to give you perspective, you know, savor and enjoy the sleeplessness and just endless mess. And it's all beautiful when you look back, right? So they offer that to us. And it's true. Now that he's 12, there's nights, I'm not super sentimental, but there's nights when I'm caught in some 
Google Photo Drive, and I'm like, oh, like watching my now 12-year-old sleeping for a minute at a time. Like, I mean, I used to record that stuff, you know? So yeah, you say the mundane moments that you're living now are the things that you will look back on later with so much gratitude and joy, right? So yeah, it's true. But man, on the flip side, the days were long, and the nights were even longer sometimes, especially when you're waiting for something that other people are enjoying with ease that you don't quite have yet. So 12 years of delay and disappointment is a time that you can't quite measure. It's beyond measure. This, is, this woman had a condition that wouldn't get better, but it got worse throughout the 12 years. She had tried everything that money could offer and was finally left with nothing to her name. Sometimes it's when we finally arrive there that we receive Jesus' nearness, God who is always with us, but now it starts to sound like good news that it really is. What's stunning about this woman is that despite all the years of disappointment, she still reached out and touched Jesus. This is not like a timid touch, like, like a doubtful touch, like, you know? It's not like, doesn't hurt to try, but if nothing happens, oh well, touch. Verse 28 says, because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And then stretched out her arm, wiggled her fingers, and leaned forward to touch him. This was faith in feeling? No. This was faith in mental agreement and assent? No. This was faith in motion. This is faith in action. Yeah. This is faith, not that we feel like it always, not that we mentally agree. I mean, sure, I do, but faith that moves our body in proximity closer to Jesus. And do you know that when you touch Jesus with your tiny mustard seed of faith, Jesus notices, Jesus knows, Jesus is truly touched. Verse 24 says, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. I would not like that. Even to my own children by certain hour in the day, I'm like, too much touching. Don't touch mommy. No more touching. I'm like sensitive to all the sights and sound and the sensory input. Like I just kind of max out after a while. There were many touching Jesus that day but not like this woman who touched him with faith that believes nothing is impossible with God. You know, she was severely anemic and weak. She was poor and isolated by being ritually unclean. She's unable to marry. She's unable to have kids. But despite her poverty and lack and hiddenness amidst all the other pressing and important events and plans and people... Her faith touched Jesus, and Jesus noticed her. Now let's think about the third character. I want to take a look at the crowd, the bystanders. There were the multitude of people who were around Jesus, you know, encircling Jesus, excited about what he's about, wanting to see what he's going to do next, right? Verse 21 says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lakeside. And it's like, I don't know, by experience, but they were like waiting for him like BTS fans. Yeah? Am I doing it right? It's like, it's like they heard that they were scheduled to be somewhere or they, there's rumors that they were going to be somewhere. So, you know, they're pressing around, waiting around that area. There's a lot of energy and buzz, right? It's like, I don't know, but I know, okay? The crowd is always around him and following him, but the crowd didn't personally reach out to Jesus. They just gawked at him. They just talked amongst themselves about him, and they ruminated in their own minds, making judgments of what's right and wrong in their own terms about whatever it is that he said and did. They were there, but not connecting themselves to Jesus personally. Verse 38 says, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with the people crying and wailing loudly. 
They cried. The crowd, the bystanders, the people, they cried at the news of Jairus' daughter's death. You know, they mourned with those who mourn. And in, if you look at verse 35, it says, Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? So the crowd, they try to help Jairus cope by giving him a dose of reality. Somebody has to do it, right? They're like, let go. You don't need Jesus anymore. Just move on with your life. And verse 40 says, they laughed at Jesus. The people laughed when Jesus said, Jairus' daughter is not dead but asleep. And so revealed that for the crowd, there's this inability to perceive that Jesus' word defines our reality. Despite what we see with our eyes in the natural and reason with our conventional wisdom. So you know what happens to these people, right? In verse 40, it says, After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciple who were with him and went in where the child was. So the ones without faith the ones not personally connected to Jesus, were not invited into Jairus' house. Meaning they are kept out rather than allowed in to witness the miracle of Talita Kum, little girl, get up. They missed out on witnessing a great glorious miracle and the power of Jesus. And finally, who is Jesus? How can we know Jesus more intimately through this passage today? Jesus is moved by earnest pleading of Jairus. You know, leaders of the synagogue were not in favor of Jesus by and large, but Jesus didn't let Jairus' affiliation and network to keep him from being moved by his earnest request. If you look at 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, The Lord sees not as man sees, Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So whatever is your title or not, whatever is your past and even your present, Jesus is moved by your request right now. And Jesus knows when you're touching him. Jesus is not unaware. He notices you. He knows when you're just kind of Mixing with the crowd, you know, woo, the hype, the moment. You know, just go through the motions. And he knows when you're reaching out to him in faith, hoping for more faith. He knows when you stretch yourself beyond your comfortable seat of belief and reserved hope to just wiggle your fingers and stretch yourself and flail your arms and touch him. Hebrew 11, 6 says, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So it's not that you only draw near to Jesus, you know, like the way the crowd did, but that you believe in the goodness of Jesus. Jesus who rewards you for seeking him and not another. He notices your faith reaching out and your faith pleases his heart. And Jesus redeems all things. The delays, they worry us and they disappoint us. They anger us and has us despairing when we lose sight. When we lose sight of Jesus who does redeem all things. What Jesus did on the cross, he didn't do it lightly. He didn't do it casually, but thoroughly and completely. With his whole self, holding nothing back and offering himself as a redeeming sacrifice for everyone. If you look at Isaiah 53, verse 3 to 5. It says, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. And he, we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. 
but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. This is Jesus. Jesus understands the 12 years of rejection and suffering and pain. He understands the fear of dying and the unfair, unjust weight of others being placed and pushed upon his own body. He understands the pain of waiting and the sense of separation from God in our darkest hour. He has lived and died through all of it for us and resurrected with power to now redeem us, to be the answer to our longings and hope in its fullness and also to walk with us in the midst of the delays and disappointments of waiting. So I want to ask, what delays and disappointments do you have in your heart right now? And how can we make way for other people who are stretching to touch Jesus and, you know, for us to not become a hindrance and roadblock for them, but encourage them, help them walk with Jesus amidst all the stuff? What do we need to do so that we are intimately invited in to witness the miracle of resurrection in one another's life in this community? So I really want to invite Echo Church to prophetically braid yourself into the story of Jairus and women with Jesus. Jesus cares for you and notices you and redeems your life. And he, so here's our plan for this week, okay? What's the plan? We just finished the devotion series. The series is finished so that you can continue your life of devotion, right? So... First is prayer, because we are a people of devotion. Maybe you've been following Jesus, but then with the delays and the disappointments, you kind of receded back into the motion of the crowd. Staying around Jesus still without personally putting yourself in Jesus' way. Is that you? But if, what if once again, we are the one that falls at Jesus' feet? the one that reaches with faith and touch him. We can do that with prayer. I want you to remember the woman. She used up everything. She had nothing to show for all that she did. Things were getting worse. You think she had like love bubbling up inside her heart and like a pep to her feet? Like, woo, let's go touch Jesus. No way. Give yourself the permission to pray poor. Pray devoid of feelings, but Keep praying. Pray frequently and faithfully, even without passion. But don't stop. Come poor and still pray. That's our first plan. And second is the word. We have to be the ones that believe Jesus at his word. Rather than the ones that laugh at him. Boxing him into what is logical and conventional in our own minds. And we can do this by daily reading the word as our foundation. Read the word and look for the ways that, you know, a verse, a story, even a word that can challenge and change your outlook right now. Just write it down somewhere. And even when your feelings and faith haven't caught up just yet, just read it over yourself. Like think about it like you're blessing yourself. I'm just going to read it for me, me to myself. Holy Spirit, help. Keep hearing God speak to the bystander. She's not, a, she's not dead, but asleep. I am at work. You just wait and see. And the third plan is community. Some of us, we do need to show up and wail with one another. This is part of being a community. Some of us, we need to deliver kind of bad news and have hard conversations.
together. You know, God and me and me and you, we can participate in the joy that comes in the morning. And I won't sing for you today. You're welcome. But Gio has been, Gio has been singing this song the last two weeks and requests to listen to it. And I'll read it to you. You guys know the song, but I don't have the grace to sing today. So it's the chorus. There will be joy in the morning. There will be joy in the morning. If it's not good, then he's not done. No, he's not done with it yet. There will be joy in the morning. Is it so much better when I don't sing? Feedback welcome, okay? (laughs) Okay, so as we close... Echo, what are you waiting for? Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. What is your personal, individual delays and disappointment? If you haven't already, or maybe if it's been a long time, name it before God. Some of your hearts are getting sicker. And there is one who has paid for our healing with his own life. So come to Jesus again and ask him for a touch that brings healing. That brings change that no money can buy. The fullness of life that is found in him. And let's raise our faith for God who will bring us answers to our prayer. Yes to pregnancies. Amen. Yes to new jobs and directions in life. Amen. Yes to physical and emotional healing. Amen. Yes to relational breakthroughs. Amen. Yes to forgiveness. Yes to revival in the heart of our loved ones and in our own hearts as well. And as a church, we've been also in a time of waiting. Have we not? Let's walk through this season with our eyes open to Jesus, who is with us and on the move. He hasn't forgotten about us. He notices a lot of your prayers of faith. And he has given us his absolute promise to never leave us nor forsake us. And that as we Love him. He is working it out for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. God has been at work. Don't you see? Hearts are turning to him. Don't you see? His ways and his timing over ours. Do you agree? I see it, Echo. I see God on the move. I see God caring for the greatest and the least of us. And I see God in the details. And yet he is sovereign still. I see God leading us to a greater trust and yieldedness than we've ever known as a church before. So that God can have his way with us in this new season. So raise your faith to God who is at work, active and alive in our midst today. Let's honor him. And how do we do that? We give him our faith. That he will have his way with us, with our community. So may we walk the season of delays and disappointments in prayer, in the word, and with one another, full of faith. And let's be the ones that are called in to witness God at work powerfully. He will do it in and through us. Amen.